Good evening. I'm Alistair Cook. Charlotte Perkins Gilman. It's hardly a household name, and it's not one that you're likely to read on the lips of scholars, literary critics, or even voracious readers. I couldn't find her in encyclopedias, literary histories of the United States, and yet, in her day, and her heyday lasted about 30 years, from 1890 to 1920, she was a most famous radical feminist lecturer, both here and in Europe. She published her own magazine, wrote most of it, put out a flock of novels. But when she was 32, in 1892, she wrote a short story, and that alone has rescued her from oblivion and fueled a small industry in uh, PhD theses, medical monographs, and recently feminist tracts. Now that story is called The Yellow Wallpaper, and it's the one that you're going to see dramatized in a single 90-minute episode. She had a rough time getting it into print, but eventually it was published by the New England Magazine, and 30 years later, William Dean Howells, who disliked it at first, put it into an anthology of great modern American stories and called it a classic and one to freeze your blood. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, I ought to say, was born in Connecticut, and the original story is placed in New England, but the writer of the screenplay has moved it to England. I think this is the first time that Masterpiece Theatre has ever relocated an American story. Here it is, the yellow wallpaper. Broken, the life and art of Charlotte Perkins Gilman and Charles Walter Stetson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight you are going to meet two fascinating people. The first is Charlotte Anna Perkins, later becoming Charlotte Perkins Stetson, and finally, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Charlotte was a humanist, suffragette, writer, lecturer, and fierce advocate for social reform. Some referred to her as a radical feminist. Her most famous short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, chronicles a woman's descent into postpartum psychosis after the birth of her child. Charlotte spent much of her time in Providence at the Providence Art Club, the Providence Athenaeum, and the Providence Ladies Sanitary Gymnasium. <laughs> the second person is Charles Walter Stetson, affectionately called Walter by those close to him. He was one of just three people who in 1878 came up with the idea of starting the Providence Art Club. The other two, George Whitaker, age 39, and Edward Mitchell Bannister, age 52. Walter Stetson was just 19 years old. A self-taught artist, Stetson received much national and international acclaim. Much of what you are about to hear tonight is taken directly from the diaries and letters written in Charlotte and Walter's own hands. This is their story. Tonight we start with the closing of Mr. Stetson's presentation on the etching process, which he gave here at the Providence Art Club on January 11th, 1882, at the ripe old age of 23. It was also on this occasion that Charlotte and Walter met for the very first time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how an etching is made. <laughs> oh my, I think you can do better than that. <laughs> Mr. Sidney Putnam, so good to see you. Wonderful talk this evening, Mr. Stetson. Why, thank you. May I introduce Ms. Perkins? Good evening, Ms. Perkins. Stetson? <laughs> May I ask what you thought of my talk this evening? Let me see. I would say it was rather a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> a waste of time? Really? You don't care for art? Oh, I care a great 
great deal for art. I'm an artist myself. I just find the etching process to be a bit of a bore. <laughs> it is more technical than artistic. Well then, perhaps you can share your perspective on art with me. Is there anything you're currently working on? Actually, I have been painting so keen trading cards with the Kendall Soap Company and have for some time now. I do not consider it serious art. However, as a woman, I am keenly aware of the need to support myself financially. Miss Perkins, won't that need be the responsibility of your husband someday? <laughs> I will not be beholden to any man. I fully intend to make my own mark on this world and to support myself financially. Your independence intrigues me. <laughs> Tell me more about these Sophie Wales. Funny you should ask. I just happen to have a few trading cards with me. Oh, to show you. You just happen to have these with you. <laughs> Here, to me, my talk. Stetson, one can never be sure when an opportunity will present itself. For washing and cleaning, so peen is the dirt killer. <laughs> these are quite good. I like the color and the clarity of form. Well done, Miss Perkins. Thank you, Stetson. However, writing is my true passion. What about you? Tell me about your art. Well, art is everything to me. I have a more exalted idea of the art sentiment. I feel myself moving towards some subject that will absorb my entire soul. I feel it approaching. That's <laughs> it. I must know you better. Well then, visit me. Perhaps tomorrow in my studio. You can come up and see my etchings. <laughs> Crescent from Philadelphia. 
They live in a very large house on the water in Narragansett called Stonely. They paid my price and even asked if it was enough. And sweeter still, they said they were willing to pay more. They sound lovely. <laughs> they are. And this, this is my latest work. I've just completed it. What do you think? Stetson, that painting is quite forward. I hope it doesn't offend. But to me, the female form is a gift from God and a gift to art. It's perfect in every way. I must agree about being perfect in every way. <laughs> However, propriety is not a virtue of artists such as you, is it? Hmm. What about you, Miss Perkins? You paint and write. First, tell me about your painting. Well, I don't know if you remember, but I have the distinct <laughs> distinction of being one of the first 100 women to exhibit right here at the Providence Art Club. Bravo, Miss Perkins, bravo! And my painting was exhibited right alongside yours. I apologize that I don't remember. Please tell me more about this painting. I titled it La Charlotte Perkins Leap. It's of this wonderful, rock ledge near a lake house <coughs> where I was babysitting the most dreadful little boy. <laughs> but I digress. Whenever I could get away from that, that creature, I would go up to the rock and I would think and dream and write. And when I was done, I would back up and take a running leap off the rock, 10 feet in the air, into the cool water below. You are adventurous, Miss Perkins. Yes, I am. People call me a tomboy, and I wear that title like a badge of honor. However, you may call me Charlotte, if you like. And you may call me Walter. May I ask what you write about? That sets Walter is for another time. Well, then at least tell me about your family, your mother and father. Where to begin? I am the proud grandniece of author Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Why, yes. I come from a long line of feature preachers. <laughs> when I was younger, my father ran off and left us destitute. He would reappear in my life now and then, bearing books. I'd say he was more of a librarian to me <laughs> than a father. My mother, she did the best she could, but she showed me no affection. I suppose it was her way of keeping me safe. The only times she would show me any affection was when she thought I was sleeping. So sometimes, I would pretend to be asleep so I could feel her soft hand on my face. That is utterly heartbreaking. I don't regret a thing. It has made me who I am, fiercely independent, loyal to a fault, a tomboy to the core. And possibly, just possibly, interested in you. <laughs> Walter, what about you? Tell me about your 
our family? Well, we both come from very humble beginnings, but that's where our stories differ. You see, my father, Joshua, is a Baptist minister at Tiverton Four Corners. And my mother, Rebecca, has stood by his side for 30 years of marriage. We were always short on money, short on coal, short on everything, except for love, that is. I think I must be going now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, Charlotte. I hope we can see each other again. I'd like that very much. They did see each other again. To defend my right to call her dear, she responded in turn. Dear Walter, being called dear Miss Perkins is a paradox. If I am Miss Perkins, the dear, which goes with that, is a mere formality. If I am dear, then I am no longer Miss Perkins. Find me a name of your own. <laughs> dear diary, Charlotte told the truth when she said she was a writer. The letters keep coming. <laughs> Dear Walter, I wish I could understand it. From the night of your lecture, when I first saw you, it seemed that I had always known you, and that you had only returned from a long journey. And then, when I met you in your studio, the feeling was confirmed. And I knew that from you, if from anyone, I must receive that of which my life has been barren. Dear diary, Charlotte is a poetess, a philosopher, and more of a mystic than she guesses, a warm, soft, sensuous nature, held in check and overcome by a strong will, a sound intellect, and a good moral nature. <laughs> Dear Walter, I half wish you were a woman. I have a haunting dread that in this joy, there may lurk some danger. You are the first man I have ever met whom I recognize as an equal. I will give and give and give you of myself, but never give myself to you or any man. Truly, I am, in appearance, a lady. <laughs> in nature, a woman. But first and always, Charlotte Anna Perkins. <coughs> My dear, sweet, Charlotte, will you marry me? Walter, you must know how much I love you. I do. <laughs> but, what? as much as I love you, I love work better. <laughs> and I cannot make the two compatible. Of course. It is too soon. Walter, do you have a moment? Why, yes, Mrs. Cresson, my wonderful benefactor. <laughs> <laughs> Having no children of my own, I think of you as my son. So I must warn you, unless Catherine can give herself up completely and become nothing, 
a marriage to her is still regarded. When she has a baby, her natural maternal instincts will kick in and she will care for the child and the home. Charlotte will change. How can she not? I do hope so, Walter, for your sake. Dear Diary, when I first asked Charlotte to marry me, her answer dug deep into my soul. Of late, though, I have a renewed hope. She has become more loving, more childlike, more dependent. She rests in me like a child might rest in her father. She no longer has the daring and independent manner of the Charlotte I first knew. She has become like what is best in other women, more thoughtful, bland, gracious, and humble. Or so I thought. And then I received this unexpected and troubling letter from Charlotte. It began, dear friend. Dear friend? Why must she do this to me? Dear friend, <laughs> I have begun this letter again and again and again, but have so far been unable to write. How can I offer even the warmest friendliness to one who asks for love? If only you did it. If only you could help it. If only you might have given me what I wanted and not this. Forgive me. I ought not complain of being offered the crown of womanhood, even if I may not wear it. The feeling of delighted companionship with which I met you so gladly at first fades to insignificance before the look in your eyes that asks for more than I dare give. I knew it would come. I was afraid of the struggle and the pain. But little did I guess that the taste would be so bitter. <laughs> Dear diary, Charlotte has stabbed me with a rugged edged knife. She has put my love to shame. As an artist, I hoped to express the loveliness of womanhood and the purity of the sexual relation. And yet, what an appalling situation to confront that the woman I chose as my lover felt unwomanly. She claims she is more Charlotte Anna Perkins than a woman. I don't believe it. Sex is the paramount thing in every human being. It is first, first, middle and last. If she is ever to work at all, she must get into harmony with that woman instead of rebelliously trying to murder it. I will not give up on her. I will endure. And Walter did endure, asking Charlotte to marry him two more times. She finally said yes, and they were married on May 2nd, 1884, on the third floor of her mother's house on the corner of Manning and Ives. Right after the ceremony, Charlotte and Walter walked the few blocks to their rented house. Ten months later, their darling daughter, Catherine, was born. At five minutes to nine in the morning on the 23rd of March, 1885. It became evident very quickly that all was not well in the Stetson household. Why? Why are you allowed to work and accomplish things of real purpose when I am not? You and Burley construct that new building on Thomas Street, the fleur-de-lis, and I am 
Charlotte, I truly believe that motherhood is the divinest thing. It is equal to love itself. It is the love of lovers. I know I'm supposed to be happy. I have given birth to a beautiful baby girl. But motherhood has brought me no joy. It is utterly bitter. You must embrace motherhood. I have a surprise for you. Something that I've been working on for quite some time. I was going to wait until Catherine's birthday to give it to you. But I think this might just cheer you, you up. Close your eyes. Turn around. Now, open them. <coughs> it's, it's you. It's you and our dear, sweet daughter, Catherine. I made it from a sketch while you were nursing her. Surely you love it. How dare you? I cannot believe that you painted this. This is morally abhorrent. This is not who I am. Why would I want to remember such darkness, such pain? I only paint the truth, what I see. Then you should see your wife nursing your daughter under a terrible, nervous depression. <coughs> my tears mingle with my milk. I do not feel love and happiness. I feel only pain. I am in a mental agony that brings me a nightmare gloom. I never want to see that painting again. What is wrong with you? How can you say such horrible, terrible, hurtful things? You are talking about our daughter, Catherine. I never, never want to see that painting again. And you never, ever will. What have I done? Have I cursed my wife? Have I cursed my daughter? I would not marry again, knowing what I do now. Charlotte has finally found her real strength, which is Weakness. I have decided to send her to Philadelphia to be treated by the world-renowned doctor, Silas Ware Mitchell. Walter's love is like sunshine in winter. I can see it plain enough, but it does not warm. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye. What can I do? How can I Fix this. It is the night of the spring 1887.
exhibition at the Providence Art Club, and Stetson has repaired the painting. He titled it, Evening, Mother, and Child. He used the lamplight effect, painting Charlotte and Catherine's reflection through a mirror. I truly believe this picture to be my best to date. My love is still in Philadelphia being treated by Dr. Mitchell. Charlotte would be quite unhappy if she knew this intimate portrait was on display here at the Providence Art Club for all to see. Charlotte writes and says that she's getting better. But I just received a letter from Dr. Mitchell who says he believes Charlotte to be truly insane. Dr. Mitchell has a very unique approach to medicine. <laughs> Stetson, dear fellow, you know and we agree that our species is defined by our gender. Women must hire a doctor and trust them, listen to them. The wisest women don't ask questions. <laughs> women like your wife who suffer from such mental anguish, for them I prescribe the rest cure. 24 hours of rest every day, <laughs> day after day. For men, I prescribe the West cure. I send them out west to engage in cattle roping and herding and musket firing and male bonding. <laughs>
and move into my studio in the Fleur de Lis. God help me. God help Catherine. I must endure. Charlotte and Catherine settled in Pasadena, California. And in 1900, Charlotte married her cousin, George Hogan Gilman. During this time, Charlotte was able to finally break free from the societal expectations of women that she fought so strongly against. There she wrote her most famous story, The Yellow Wallpaper, along with a dozen other books and hundreds of short stories. She toured the world as a much admired public speaker and fought tirelessly in support of a woman's right to vote. Charlotte took her own life in 1935 after being diagnosed with inoperable breast cancer. She wrote her own obituary and had it published upon her death. The title was, I Chose Chloroform Over Cancer. After Walter and Charlotte divorced in 1894, he remarried and moved with his second wife to Rome, where they were joined by Catherine. There, Catherine studied art after attending the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. Walter continued to paint and received much international acclaim, accepting numerous awards throughout Europe. He died in Rome after a short illness at the age of 52. He died in Rome. His ashes are scattered from the bow of a ship somewhere in the Mediterranean by his Catherine on her voyage back to America. Seven of his paintings are in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C. The painting of Charlotte breastfeeding Catherine had been broken into five pieces and then intricately repaired. It was sold to Mrs. Cresson in 1888, and upon her death, it was given to Catherine in 1909. It toured the country in the Stetson Memorial Expo Exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, among others. <clears throat> Mother? Oh, hello, my dear, sweet daughter, Catherine. I so enjoy being surrounded by your beautiful paintings. You are such a talented artist. Thank you, Father. Catherine, do you remember when I painted that portrait of you in the orange grove in Pasadena when you were just five years old? Yes, I think so, Father. It looks like things aren't broken after all.
well, on, on to the staff. This took a lot of work yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next month, uh, May 19th, we're going to have a talent show. So uh, put it in the crowd.